Hey everyone, hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to be reading 1 Kings 7, Esther 4, and Isaiah 1. Now let's pray before we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this day that we might spend with you and get to know you a little bit more. Thank you so much for all the blessings that you've poured out on us that we don't deserve and allowing us to be a part of your perfect purpose. Please guide us with your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our minds to anything that you would have us to know in your word today, or any convictions you may be laying on our hearts. Please forgive us of our sins and lead us away from temptation, that we might be more like you and glorify you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now right, let's get started. First Kings 7 It took Solomon thirteen years, however, to complete the construction of his palace. He built the palace of the forest of Lebanon a hundred cubits long, fifty wide, and thirty high, with four rows of cedar columns supporting trimmed cedar beams. It was roofed with cedar above the beams that rested on the columns, forty-five beams, fifteen to a row. Its windows were placed high in sets of three, facing each other. All the doorways had rectangular frames. They were in the front part in sets of three facing each other. He made a colonnade fifty cubits long and thirty wide. In front of it was a portico, and in front of that were pillars and an overhanging roof. He built the throne hall, the hall of justice, where he was to judge, and he covered it with cedar from floor to ceiling. And the palace in which he was to live, set farther back, was similar in design. Solomon also made a palace like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had married. All these structures, from the outside to the great courtyard and from foundation to eaves, were made of blocks of high-grade stone cut to size and smooth on their inner and outer faces. The foundations were laid with large stones of good quality, some measuring ten cubits and some eight. Above were high-grade stones, cut to size, and cedar beams. The great courtyard was surrounded by a wall of three courses of dressed stone and one course of trim cedar beams, as was the inner courtyard of the temple of the Lord with its portico. King Solomon sent to Tyr and brought Huram, whose mother was a widow from the tribe of Naphtali, and whose father was from Tyr and a skilled craftsman in bronze. Huram was filled with wisdom with understanding and with knowledge to do all kinds of bronze work. He came to King Solomon and did all the work assigned to him. He cast two bronze pillars, each 18 cubits high and 12 cubits in circumference. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. Each capital was five cubits high. A network of interwoven chains adorned the capitals on top of the pillars, seven for each capital. He made pomegranates in two rows, encircling each network to decorate the capitals on top of the pillars. He did the same for each capital. The capitals on top of the pillars in the portico were in the shape of lilies, four cubits high. On the capitals of both pillars, above the bowl-shaped part next to the network, were the two hundred pomegranates in rows all around. He erected the pillars at the portico of the temple. The pillar to the south he named Jachin, and the one to the north, Boaz. The capitals on top were in the shape of lilies, and so the work on the pillars was completed. He made the sea of cast metal, circular in shape, measuring ten cubits from rim to rim, and five cubits high. It took a line of thirty cubits to measure around it. Below the rim, gourds encircled it, ten to a cubit. The gourds were cast in two rows in one piece with the sea. The sea stood on twelve bulls, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea rested on top of them, and their hindquarters were toward the center. It was a handbreadth in thickness, and its rim was like the rim of a cup, like a lily blossom. It held two thousand baths. He also made ten movable stands of bronze. Each was four cubits long, four wide, and three high. This is how the stands were made. They had side panels attached to uprights. On the panels between the uprights were lions, bulls, and cherubim, and on the uprights as well. 
Above and below the lions and bulls were wreaths of hammered work. Each stand had four bronze wheels with bronze axles, and each had a basin resting on four supports, cast with wreaths on each side. On the inside of the stand there was an opening that had a circular frame one cubit deep. This opening was round, and with its base work it measured a cubit and a half. Around its opening there was engraving. The panels of the stands were square, not round. The four wheels were under the panels and the axles of the wheels were attached to the stand. The diameter of each wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like chariot wheels. The axles, rims, spokes, and hubs were all of cast metal. Each stand had four handles, one on each corner, projecting from the stand. At the top of the stand, there was a circular band, half a cubit deep. The supports and panels were attached to the top of the stand. He engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees on the surfaces of the supports and on the panels in every available space, with wreaths all around. This is the way he made the ten stands. They were all cast in the same molds and were identical in size and shape. He then made ten bronze basins, each holding forty baths and measuring four cubits across, one basin to go on each of the ten stands. He placed five of the stands on the south side of the temple and five on the north. He placed the sea on the south side at the southeast corner of the temple. He also made the pots and shovels and sprinkling bowls. So Huram finished all the work he had undertaken for King Solomon in the temple of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the two sets of network decorating the two bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the 400 pomegranates for the two sets of network, two rows of pomegranates for each network decorating the bowl-shaped capitals on top of the pillars, the ten stands with their ten basins, the sea and the twelve bowls under it, the pots, shovels, and sprinkling bowls. All these objects that Huram made for King Solomon for the temple of the Lord were of burnished bronze. The king had them cast in clay molds in the plain of the Jordan between Sukkoth and Zarethan. Solomon left all these things unweighed because there were so many. The weight of the bronze was not determined. Solomon also made all the furnishings that were in the Lord's temple, the golden altar, the golden table on which was the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the right and five on the left, in front of the inner sanctuary, the gold floral work and lamps and tongs, the pure gold basins, wick trimmers, sprinkling bowls, dishes and censers, and the gold sockets for the doors of the innermost room, the most holy place, and also for the doors of the main hall of the temple. When all the work King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. Esther 4 When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. 
Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this? Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Isaiah 1 the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amoz saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord, they have spurned the Holy One of Israel, and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with olive oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners, right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. Daughter Zion is left, like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a cucumber field, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts, and your appointed festivals. I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See how the faithful city has become a prostitute? She once was full of justice. Righteousness used to dwell in her. But now, murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your choice wine is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, partners with thieves. They all love bribes and chase after gifts. They do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case 
does not come before them. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the Mighty One of Israel, declares, Ah, I will vent my wrath on my foes, and avenge myself on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove all your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness. But rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks in which you have delighted. You will be disgraced because of the gardens that you have chosen. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. The mighty man will become tinder, and his work a spark. Both will burn together, with no one to quench the fire. Thanks for joining and listening today. If you have any questions, leave them down here in the comments section, and I'll be making some videos where I go through some of those questions, show you some of the questions that I had, and maybe we can find some answers or even dive into it together. Thanks, guys. Hit the like and subscribe, and come back for more. All right, guys. Take it easy. Bye. God bless.